Fine. Um, as Mohammed says, these um, abstract 45 series lectures are designed to kind of showcase some of our research. And they're also designed to be a bit provocative. And I hope I can sort of live up to both, but especially provocative, because the topic I'm going to talk about today is AI. Now, AI is all around us. We, we cannot now evade it. Um, it's a world full of AI. And AI is making huge strides in the world, especially in fields like medical education, um, especially in the fields like medicine itself, and especially in the field of education in universities generally, and much wider afield. So AI is a hot topic at the moment. And there's certain things where we can see where AI is going to lead. And we know, for example, in medicine, it will make huge strides. We can probably predict that quite, quite easily. But there are certain concerns with AI as well. And I've no doubt you've watched the press reports and you've heard about the hearings in America and so on, where people have been quite concerned about some of the potential effects of AI interference in elections um, and things like that. So there could be quite serious concerns with it. I'm not going to talk about that today. My, my concern is with something quite different. I'm concerned with generative AI and language use. Because for me, language use is really what my, forms the basis of, of my study. So I'm going to say something about that as, as, as I go on. So I'm going to say something about what chat GPT is. You've probably heard of this by now. If you haven't, you might be living on the planet Mars. Um, so I'll say something about that. Um, and I'll say something about how it looks at words, how it produces words. And it's not the same way that we produce words. And then I'm going to talk about a word. I'm going to give you a word about words, how we talk about words. And I'll give you two different kind of perspectives on words. Then I'll talk about studying talk and text, and specifically talk, uh, because much of my research has involved studying people talking. And the talk that I've looked at is predominantly in the public services. And you might ask, why the public services? Because in the public services, that's where people do a lot of talking. Doctors talk to patients, nurses talk to patients, police interview suspects, and so on. So the public services are where a lot of talk is generated. And I'll go on to talk about how nurses talk about their career decisions. We'll look at how doctors uh, talk to patients and how patients talk to doctors. And then we'll move on to the world of policing and some of the work that's been done on that. Now I'll introduce some of the work done by one of my colleagues, Liz Stoko at Loughborough University, who did some work on police interview. And then I'll round up by talking about AI lines and words. And you might be thinking, what's, what's he talking about there? We'll get there when, when, when we get there. OK, so chat GPT. Chat GPT, in case you haven't heard of it, is an artificial intelligence program. Um, it's freely available. 3.5 version is freely available at the moment. Um, you can ask it questions. It will respond to you. You can type in a question. It'll give you back an answer. The secret with chat GPT is really in asking the type of questions that you want to ask it. But it's based on what's known as what's called a large language model. And it produces um, what is seemingly natural type language. Seemingly. Now these large language models are trained on huge amounts of textual data. Massive amounts of textual data. And it can generate contextually relevant as well as coherent um, sort of information. And it's got what's called an attention mechanism. And basically, that mechanism assess, ass, sort of assigns weights to different words. So basically, it's almost like a parrot. It doesn't know what it's saying, but it's looking at how words go together and the probabilities of these words going together. And that's the kind of way it works. Its responses are not based on what we do. We use language differently because I'm going to argue we use language to do stuff in the world, a lot of stuff. We use language to explain, to excuse, to justify, to rationalize, to praise, to blame, and so on. 
many different actions that we use are performed through language. In fact, you could argue language, or put in inverted commas, is a species of action. So, whilst ChatGPT can look apparently human, it's not. And it can produce output that can sometimes be quite nonsensical. Um, our students, some of them anyway here, have found that out to their cost when they have looked up ChatGPT and perhaps have got answers that they didn't think they, they expected. Um, and these are known as hallucinations. Right? It's argued it hallucinates, it makes up things uh, if it doesn't understand things. It just makes it up. Now I'll move on to language. We can view language in a couple of different ways. One of them is as a communication system. Right? A bit like um, sending, say, letters through the post or emails between each other. We can think about language like that. An idea is, I have a, a, a message, I put it into words, send it off to you, you get it at the other end, and decode it and understand it. Now, that's one way of viewing language. We call that a communication model of language. So the idea is, it's a bit like sending emails or sending letters, and people are interested in understanding what the other person said. But of course, the world's a bit more than just understanding. Now, if there was just understanding to the world, it would strip out everything about the politics and meaning of life that we've got. So the world is more than simply understanding. And we can turn to another writer that might help us understand that. And that's Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein argues in his posthumous book, Philosophical Investigations, that words are like a kind of toolbox that we can draw upon. And these tools that we can use for different purposes. And of course, you'll know that the same tool can be used for different purposes. A hammer can be used to hammer in things. It can be used to prise open a lid. You can do many different things with the same tool. And likewise with words. Right? We can do many, many different things with words and the same tool. In fact, the same word could have different meanings in different contexts. Okay? You could say, for example, I love you to somebody in one context, and it might be to, to a relative you say that, and it's another context. There's a completely different meaning. So the meanings of words change with the context. And really, woe betide anybody that misses that, because we call that the indexical properties of talk. Meaning is indexed, tied to the occasion of use. Right? You cannot understand somebody's words without understanding the context in which they used it. And if you do, you pull language out from where it is. You pull language out from the hurly-burly of life, where people are using it, and you abstract it into a kind of theoretical world of abstraction where people are not using words. So we've got to be very, very careful. We look at where words are used. And someone else that can help us with this is Harvey Sachs. Now, Harvey Sachs is the inventor of a field called conversation analysis, CA. And in that field, Harvey Sachs looked at, for example, very simple mechanisms for conversation. For example, question and answer. Right? And these are called what we call adjacency pairs. They're adjacent to each other. If I ask a question, what's normally expected back is an answer. If an answer is not forthcoming, then that will be treated as problematic by the conversationalist concerned. If I got, give out an invitation, if I invite you to something, what's normally expected back is an acceptance. Right? What we call the preferred response. A non-preferred response would be for you to refuse. So, for example, if I say, I'm having a party, my house, see there, it's Saturday night, 8 o'clock, it'd be much more difficult for you to, to refuse that than to accept it. Now, to, to refuse it, you'd have to come up with an account, some kind of excuse. So you might say, well, Jim, I'd love to come to your party, but uh, unfortunately I'm going to the cinema that night, or I'm seeing other friends that night, or whatever. You could be lying. It doesn't matter. If I don't know that, it works as an excuse. Both parties save face, and everybody walks away from that interaction okay. 
conversational refusals take much, much more conversational work than acceptances. And in fact, there's been a lot of work done on that, uh, for, for example, women and dating and so on, and refusals, and the idea of conversational refusal, but much, much more hard work involved in it. Likewise, if I'm doing a greeting and I say hello to you, you'd be expected to greet me back and say, hi, how are you doing, fine, all of that sort of stuff. If you don't, that's treated as a bit problematic. And again, people will align to that and try and sort that out. So if I said to you, hi, and you said nothing back, I might think, well, what's happened there? Or I might think, you know, have you seen me? Or have you ignored me or what? So conversation analysis looks at these kind of what we call adjacency pairs, but it also looks at the kind of categories that people draw upon. And we'll see that in a wee minute when we look at police um, sort of interviewing suspects. So, Harvey Sachs, unfortunately, died in a, in a car accident when he was 40 and had published relatively little uh, by that time. And so, his graduate students got together, gathered up his lecture notes, and his lecture notes were published posthumously in two volumes, now one volume, um, in that book there. So this kind of analysis sort of studies what we call naturally occurring conversation. It's not contrived, it's where the action happens. <coughs> if people are talking in a certain way, whether it be teaching in a lecture theatre, whether it be in a courtroom, whether it be in a doctor's surgery, that's where conversation analysts will go and study what people are doing. And Sachs said this, now it looks conversational because it's drawn from Sachs's lecture notes. Like this is not drawn from a kind of polished book. Sachs said, don't worry how fast they're thinking. First of all, don't worry, worry whether they're thinking. Just try to come to terms with how it is they, these things come off, because you'll find that they can do these things. Now what Sachs is telling us there is, don't worry about how fast people can think. In fact, don't worry about a mental world at all. Put that aside, bracket it off like you would do in mathematics. Put it aside. All you need to study is what people are doing with their talk. Don't track back to worlds of mentalism. Don't track back to anything like that at all. Simply look and study what people are doing with their talk. And I can give you an example of that here. Look at this piece of, this is a real piece of, of transcript. The pauses there, the times that you see there are in seconds. So 1.3 seconds, 1.5 seconds. It's a child who says, have to cut these mummy. 1.3 seconds goes by. Now you might think that's relatively little amount of time. In conversational terms, 1.3 seconds is an agonizingly long amount of time. Nothing, no response back. No second part to the adjacency pair. Question, no answer back. Child, won't we, mummy? 1.5 seconds goes by. Won't we? And the mum says eventually, oh, yes, 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 we'll, 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 we'll cut them, yes, yes, okay. Now, people often marvel how many words a child has learned by the age of three or five or whatever it is. Most children recognise around about 1,000 words by the age of three, they can use maybe about 400 uh, by that age. But what's even more amazing is they learn how to do things with language. Nobody sat down that child and said, I'm going to teach you about adjacency pairs and what to do. Somehow along the line, that child has learned how to basically truncate a whole, truncate that like You see the pattern there being truncated. Somebody has, the, the, the child has picked that up by being immersed in culture. And we all do. Now, if a child can do that at three years of age, think of what you can do. Think of the possibilities of what you can do. That's a child at three. So, that's one form of analysis. We can also study textual material. We call that discourse analysis. Sometimes discourse analysis verges into conversation analysis. We could have a bit of a chat about that. I often joke with my students 
Um, it's a bit like Heinz. There are 57 different varieties um, of discourse analysis, but we'll stick with that, okay? So we can look at how words are put together to have what we call a rhetorical effect. Rhetorical effects are how they're constructed to persuade. And some of the work I've done, and I won't give it here, has done that looking at how politicians put their talk together to persuade, to get you in the end to vote for them. Uh, so we can look at that, or we can take another stage and we can look at, for example, the relationship between words or language and power. That field is called CDA, Critical Discourse Analysis. So for example, how news stories in the press shape our worldviews, how they frame um, how we view the world. Again, not for this particular lecture here. So let's go on and look at some of the things that I've looked at throughout my, my kind of academic career. One of the first things I did uh, was here long ago, uh, was interview nursing students. And I was really interested in what they had to say about why they had selected nursing as a career. And they gave me answers, many of them, something like this. Okay? So they would say things like, um, all you're ever doing is what the person needs, the most basic thing, maybe just to listening to them. That's what nursing is. Or they would say, you have to be caring and understanding. You have to have patience as well as knowing how to approach a person. Now, when you put somebody on the spot and ask them, why do you want to do nursing? The likelihood is they're going to give you an answer that conforms with what you would expect. They draw upon a kind of what we call a repertoire, like a set piece answer. And that repertoire is basically what we see there. That's what we call an interpretative repertoire. They're giving me that. But some students didn't give me that. Here's one here. Some students talked about what we call family influence. So I asked, why do you want to go into the field of nursing? This person said, my mum had been a nurse. I've lots of relatives who are nurses. And they sort of, not influenced, but I'd always, be, I'd always been interested in what they had to say about their work. Now look at what I do next. You say there's people in your family who are nurses. Did they influence you? Right? I've picked up on her use of influence and I've put it back to her. And it's a she, by the way. And she says, when they'd come home, they'd talk about their work and things like that. But with me, it's that I've always wanted to be a nurse. Now, she doesn't literally mean ever since the moment she was born, she always wanted to be a nurse. This student here is trying to, to, to kind of show commitment to the field of nursing. She's trying to show she's always wanted to be a nurse. She's trying to show me some commitment to that field. So what do I do? Pick back up on what she said. When you say you've always wanted to be a nurse, what is it that attracted you to this area? I could give you many jobs where you'd be working with people. Why specifically nursing? And she says, it's more personal with the person being a nurse. Now what she never does is give me the I'm a kind of person type discourse. She doesn't do that. And that's why that particular student was verbally chased after in that interview, question after question, and she still didn't give me the I'm a kind of person type discourse. So one type of discourse is rhetorically more persuasive, and the other type of discourse is less so. Giving a family influence type of discourse doesn't really work that well. We also did some work with nurses about how they report poor care. Now you might have no, I've seen this in the press. There have been many instances of, for example, care homes um, or nursing wards in hospitals where there have been instances of poor care, sometimes abuse. And you've probably heard about that and there's been umpteen inquiries into these things as well. And we wanted to go and ask student nurses, if you've seen any poor care, why did you or did you not report it? Because under the guidelines for nursing, you are duty bound to report poor care if you see it. 
Now, poor care could be somebody lifting somebody, something the wrong way. It could be from that end of the spectrum through to quite serious abuse. So, we looked at the kinds of accounts that were given back. And here's one of them here. Somebody, somebody would accept responsibility. So they, they would reach what we call a dispositional account. I'm not the kind of person who sits back and ignores these things. Okay, so that kind of account is somebody saying, it's in me, I'm not the kind of person that's going to sit back and watch this go on. And they're drawing attention to their disposition. Now, we don't need to get into the, if that's their real personality or not. We just look at the kind of talk they produced in the there and then of that particular interview. Some students would externalise. They would point to something beyond them. So they would say things like, as a student, I have to follow my NMC guidelines, that's National Morifera Council guidelines, about risk management and patient safety. So instead of pointing to something, something in their disposition, they're externalising it and pointing to the NMC guidelines as their source for paying attention to, to, to poor care. But many of the students said, even if they'd seen poor care, they wouldn't report it. And here's a couple of the kind of exonerations that they would give. One of them said, the biggest thing people worry about is making a name for themselves by reporting. So the idea, you are marked. If you report poor care and you're a student on the ward, you are marked. You have made it life difficult for yourself. Or a second exoneration, sometimes you don't think, you think that is, that is what happens, and then when you leave, you actually go, no. So the idea, the person saying there, I think I saw something that was suspect, but you know what, I let it be, but then after I'd left, I thought, well, maybe. So in that particular instance, this student is, is basically coming up with a wasn't sure type of exoneration. It's a bit like the phrase, I don't know. I don't know is a fascinating phrase to, to study. Um, some of my students will tell you. Okay. So how about doctor-patient interaction? We got some money from the chief scientist's office to go and look at uh, some doctor-patient interaction. Because at the time, one of the big things in medical edu education and in medicine was what was called SDM, shared decision-making. So the idea when you go to your doctor, your doctor's meant to be inclusive, share the decision-making with you, talk to you in that kind of manner, use we a lot, and so on. So we, it took us many months to get ethical approval for this. We actually managed to record some doctors talking to patients. So here's one here. This doctor says, right, that's right, because you had problems with amaldipine, uh, didn't you? But the new ones, and the patient comes in, the new ones, doctor, are agreeing with you. What would you think about increasing the dose a wee bit and try and get, and the patient comes in, yeah, I, I thought I was doing all right. Doctor, well, you are doing all well. The thing about it is I could show you some, uh, I've got a computer chart. I could show you the difference between, uh, sorry, lowering your blood pressure a wee bit would make if you want to. Now, notice the words a wee bit, right? It's a, minima it's a kind of minimization, a wee bit, okay? We'll try a, a wee bit. So this doctor is trying to gain patient agreement through using words like a wee bit. Um, the patient says they think, they think they're doing okay. Um, but notice how the doctor also comes in at several points. Now that's kind of fairly typical of doctor-patient intera interaction. What about the other way around? What about a patient who wants to come to a doctor and make a request to be seen by a consultant, a specialist? So the doctor, standard opening, now what can I do for you? Uh, patient, um, loads of things, laughing, could have been a nervous laugh, hopefully. Doctor, okay. Patient, first of all, um, could you please refer me to dermatology? Doctor, mm-hmm. Patient, for my face. It looks okay just now. Actually, doctor, yes, but what's the what's problems are you, are you having with it? So... The doctor taps in there to, I mean, the, the patient's basically saying, look, I've no problem with my face at the moment, but 
That's why I'm here, and I want to be referred to, to a dermatologist, but the doctor kind of takes from that and leads into that conversation. So it's quite interesting to kind of study how that patient has gotten early with that request to be referred to a specialist. Let's move on. Police suspect interaction and blame management. Okay, so this is a police officer. Police officer P01 is police officer 1. Sus is the suspect. And P02 is police officer 2. And the police officer says, do you remember her falling to the ground? Suspect, me, yeah, see, I were pulling her. And I pulled her arm to keep her away from me. And like, I swung her arm like that, and she fell. She fell to the lawn. But the way is not to kick a woman, as you might say. I wouldn't do that. Wouldn't be right for me to do that. Papers rustling. Police officer too. But you'd kick a bloke in the head three times. Now look at what's going on there, right? This isn't just somebody, this isn't police officers trying to understand what this, what this particular suspect is saying, okay? Police officer, do you, do you remember her falling to the ground? So the police officer is inviting, as, as a standard practice, for the suspect to give their version of events. The suspect comes in with, I were pulling her, I were pulling her to, keep, to keep her away from me. So right away, the suspect is saying, he's, they're kind of trying to offer mitigation here, trying to pull, pull somebody away from me. And I swung her arm like that, and then she fell to the lawn. Not I pushed her to the lawn, she fell to the lawn. So again, there's a minimization, a mitigation going on there, trying to play it all down. And then the suspect produces a category. Right? This is why categories are important. The suspect didn't just simply download this category from memory, okay, and, and sort of produce that category. Look at this. The way is not to kick a woman, as you might say. I wouldn't do that. Wouldn't be right for me to do that. Now that suspect is producing a moral version of events here. What they're trying to show is not just the woman that I was involved with in, in the kind of assault or alleged assault, but any woman. So they produced the category woman, meaning a moral position. I wouldn't attack or kick any woman at all. And then, at that point, police officer two comes in and says, but you'd kick a bloke in the head three times. Now, police officer two, obviously if you're a police officer, you have to work out, is there a chargeable offence that I can make against the suspect? And police officer two, when that police officer comes in there, is basically saying, I think we've got you on a chargeable offence of assault. You'd kick a bloke in the head three times. Three times, not just once, not just twice, three times implies a certain level of violence. And so that police officer there has levelled the accusation, and it is an accusation, basically, that way to suggest, I think we've possibly got you on a charge of assault. So it's quite interesting to study these kind of interactions. We can also look at police reporting. And this is some of, my, some of the latest work I've done. Um, we've looked at Police Scotland's um, equality, diversity and inclusion strategy. And we've kind of looked at some of the documents they produced, their reports, their EDI strategy and so on. And the police say this. Our position on racism is and always will be that it has no place in society or policing. We will be firm and progressive as we become anti -racist, an anti-racist organisation. Those with racist views do not belong in Police Scotland and they do not represent our organisation. The first thing you notice about that is look at the, the pronouns, our, our organisation. Right? So again, they're alluding to kind of pride in the organisation and they're saying you don't belong in our, our the inclusive our organisation um, if you espouse any kind of racist views. And then they go on and say this, pockets of unacceptable conduct must be eradicated so that each and every division, department and team delivers a consistent experience for all colleagues. 
Now look at the description. That's not a neutral, value-free, doing nothing description of the world. Pockets, right? The, the implication there is there's only pockets of potential racism in the police service. Now I should remind you that the outgoing police of chief, chief constable, Sir Ian Livingston, when he left in August, said these words. It was his words. He argued, Police Scotland is an institutionally racist and misogynist organisation. That was his words. So the same kind of report here kind of elides that and sort of says, well, there are pockets of unacceptable conduct. Not institutionally, pockets. And then they say local engagement is critical. To do this meaningfully and effective, effectively requires genuine dialogue, respect, integrity, transparency and accountability. So again, they're reaching out and they're trying to say, we are trying to be, as it were, create a dialogue with the public that will involve respect. And the police there are, are involved um, in what we call trying to gain police legitimacy. Because if the police lose legitimacy, they are in all sorts of bother. If we can't trust the police, then who can we trust? So the police are trying as, if, as hard as they can there to reach out and say, we are trying, as it were, to persuade you we are on top of this. And we see that in their discourse of community. Right? They keep alluding to the word community. If I could count up how many times they use the word community in their reporting, but they say, police and it was them that said it here, police legitimacy is drawn from the bond of trust with our communities. Building and maintaining that relationship with all our communities is vital. So again, they're reaching out, they're arguing, we need to build that trust with communities. And they're trying to persuade you, the public, that that's what it's all about. And they say, our understanding of the term community has evolved over time and is no longer limited to communities of geography. People also identify as part of communities formed through other shared characteristics, beliefs and experiences. So they're recognising that basically community is not just a kind of geographical concept that it takes on board uh, communities, whether they belong to um, the LGBT community or whatever it might be. So they're, they're kind of playing up on that. Police Scotland have argued, when, well, said when we approached them with this research and the findings, you guys are the experts, hold us to account. If we do not change our ways, hold us to account. And I think I I'm, I'm, would like to get back on them on that um, and see what they do about that. OK, moving on. I did tell you I'd come to AI lines and words. Back to Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein argues in his book Philosophical Investigations, he said if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand him. Now, nowadays we would use a person or whatever, but he uses him at the time. Why did he say that? Because we don't inhabit the world of lions. We inhabit the human world and we use language for human purposes. So if we were to try and if we were to listen to a lion, we wouldn't understand the world of lions because we're not in, inhabit the world of lions. That's not our world. Generative AI is not based on the human world of language for action. It does not consider, it cannot understand what we are doing when we do stuff through language. It cannot understand how somebody does an excuse, how somebody does a rationalisation how somebody praises somebody. It cannot do that. It can kind of spot features of it, but it can't do it. It cannot use its analytic intuition and do a piece of conversation analysis like I would do. And I'll show you why, because I asked, you asked G GPT, chat GPT to go and do that. So when we do conversation analysis, we ourselves are members of the very culture that we seek to study we draw upon that intuitive knowledge, that's the first stage, and then we go and look at how the conversationalists themselves orientated to each other in that conversation. So it's not me as a sociologist saying this is what's going on, it's the conversationalists themselves, how they orientate toward each other, and how they take from what each other says, respond back, 
and back and forward and so on. So I did ask ChatGPT to go and perform a conversation, a piece of conversation analysis. And it was from a courtroom interaction. Okay, and here it is here, okay? It's a lawyer, um, it's a cross-examining lawyer, and the cross-examining lawyer is cross-examining the witness who also happens to be the complainant. And if you read it there, you'll see, well, didn't he ask you uh, on the night that he wanted you to be his girl? 0.5 of a second goes by. Didn't he ask you that? 2.5 seconds goes by. Witness, I don't remember what he said to me that night. 1.2 seconds goes by. Well, you had some fairly lengthy conversations with the defendant, didn't you? Lawyer, on the evening of February the 14th, witness, we were all talking. Now, that's a fairly typical piece of cross-examination by a lawyer in a courtroom cross-examining a witness. Here's what chat GPT made of it. Okay, it said, the lawyer employs direct, a direct questioning strategy to elicit specific information from the witness. The questions are straightforward, are they? And focused on particular events or statements made by the defendant. The lawyer repeats the same question multiple times in an attempt to clarify or confirm the witness's recollection of events. Yeah? This repetition serves to emphasise the importance of questions and to prompt the witness to provide a consistent answer. Now that's what chat GPT says, that's what it made of that particular uh, conversational exchange. Here's my analysis. I said the use of yes-no interrogatives, well didn't he ask you that uh, on the night if he wanted you to be his girl? When no answer is forthcoming after 0.5 of a second, uh, a truncated yes-no interrogative is put, didn't he ask you that? The lawyer's use of fairly lengthy conversations with the defendant, sorry, with the witness, this statement is followed by the yes-no interrogative tag, didn't you? This implies that it would be difficult to forget what was said. Okay, so the lawyer's saying, well, you had some fairly lengthy conversations with someone. The lawyer's implying that would be very difficult for you to forget that, wouldn't you? Okay, so something like that. The mention of evening, the evening of February the 14th, the date is not referred to St. Valentine's Day, although an overhearing jury will most likely be aware that this is the case and the association with romanticism. This is an important point in the context of alleged assault, which may be used to undermine the victim's credibility, given the implication of potential romantic attachment with the defendant. So we can see here a cross-examining lawyer is doing everything that a cross-examining lawyer is expected to do, which is undermine the witness's credibility. Now again, that's not value-free, doing nothing, using words. That's words put to a purpose, which chat GPT patently does not get. So I ended off asking chat GPT, what did you make of my analysis? And it said, your analysis offers a more nuanced and comprehensive examination of the linguistic, procedural and rhetorical dimensions of the exchange. I'm glad I could help illuminate these topics for you. Good luck with your studies in sociology or criminology and have a great day. <laughs> okay, so that's chat GPT. At present, chat GPT, I say at present, who knows in the future, can provide some kind of rudimentary analytical points when conducting C, but it's, it's far off beam, it's way off beam. CA is a craft skill based on human understanding of what is going on with that talk, what are people doing with that talk, and the way that conversationalists use turn-taking to produce meaningful actions. And that's been the kind of mainstay of the, much of the work that I've done, looking at how people use talk to perform action. Now, I could have asked ChatGPT if it could understand talking lions. Um, perhaps it maybe might have halluc hallucinated a little bit, I don't know. 
but there you go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.